Let's ultrasound. On today's edition of Small Parts Ultrasound, we're diving into salivary gland pathology. Next, let's talk about common symptoms and also risk factors for salivary gland pathology. When things go awry in the salivary glands, some common symptoms can be a lump or pain, a foul taste in the mouth, fever, heat, swelling, redness. You can get chipmunk cheeks, which is bilateral parotid inflammation, dry mouth, and this is due to a lack of saliva, and also numbness or weakness in the face or the neck in the region of the glands. And these symptoms can occur unilaterally or bilaterally, depending upon which glands are affected. Risk factors for salivary gland pathology, and this is for all pathologies such as masses and inflammation, etc., are smoking, salivary gland duct obstruction, such as stones or trauma to the ducts, a history of prior radiation exposure to the area, exposure to some viruses, a couple common ones are Epstein-Barr, flu, HIV, mumps, etc., increased age, greater than 50 to 60, most common, and also Sjogren's syndrome, which is an autoimmune disorder. Now let's talk about some of the common pathologies that can occur in the salivary glands. The first one is inflammation, also called saladitis. This is inflammation of one or more salivary glands, and it most commonly occurs in the parotid and the submandibular glands. This is most commonly seen in the elderly and also in newborns in the first few weeks of life. An abscess may or may not form, and you may also view enlargement of the parotid lymph nodes. Symptoms are going to be pain, redness, fever, dry mouth from decreased saliva, and also swelling. This is one of the causes of the chipmunk cheeks, which are bilateral, inflamed, enlarged parotid glands. Causes of this are due to a virus or bacteria, such as mumps, staph, HIV, etc., Sjogren's syndrome, sarcoidosis, or a salivary duct stone can block the duct, leading to obstruction, inflammation, and even infection. In cases of acute salanditis, the gland is going to appear heterogeneous on ultrasound with multiple small hypoechoic regions and side. It's going to be hypervascular with Doppler ultrasound. It's going to appear lobulated, enlarged, and with a relatively hypoechoic background echogenicity. In cases of chronic salienditis, the gland is going to be hypoechoic and heterogeneous. The next salivary gland pathology is sialosis, and this is an enlarged gland, but it's not due to inflammatory response. This is a non-inflammatory enlargement of one or more salivary glands. Most commonly, this occurs bilaterally. It's usually painless. This can be a chronic condition. It's most commonly found in the parotid gland, and it's fairly rare. Causes of Saliosis include diabetes, ETOH, which is heavy alcohol use, obesity, liver disease, pregnancy, endocrine disorders, or it can be idiopathic, and it's commonly associated with systemic disorders. The next salivary gland pathology is psilolithiasis. This is when one or more stones form in the salivary gland parenchymal ducts or within one of the main salivary export ducts. And it's important to distinguish between an intraparenchymal duct stone versus a main duct stone, as the treatments for these can potentially be different. In the parotid gland, Stenson's duct is the main export duct. In the submandibular gland, Wharton's duct is the primary export duct where a stone may be found. And in the sublingual gland, most commonly when a stone is visualized, it's actually related to the Wharton's duct which is a submandibular duct, rather than one of the tiny sublingual gland ducts. 
a stone within the sublingual ducts is rare. Salivary gland stones most commonly form in the submandibular gland, and these stones cause obstruction and dilation of the duct, which can lead to inflammation and infection of the salivary gland. Some pitfalls of salivary stone identification include a stone on ultrasound will have posterior acoustic shadowing, which is dark black shadowing or dark gray shadowing. You can also get air bubbles in the duct, which can mimic the appearance of stones as they are white. However, the air bubbles in the duct will have a gray or white, what we call dirty shadow, rather than a black or dark gray shadow like a stone. Another pitfall of stone identification is that most sublingual stones are actually submandibular stones within the Wharton's duct rather than within the actual sublingual gland itself or within the sublingual gland ducts as Wharton's gland directly travels anteriorly over the sublingual glands. Another pitfall to stone identification is the attenuation of sound waves from a fatty gland signal, and this can obscure duct and also stone visualization on ultrasound. Here are three ultrasound diagrams showing common stone locations that can be visualized on an ultrasound. To the far left, we have a transverse left parotid gland, and you'll note that the gland itself is hyperechoic in color, and it's shaped roughly like a T-shape with the top portion of the gland being above the bones, which are the mandible and the mastoid process, and the bottom portion of that deep left parotid forming the base of the T. The retromandibular vein is going to be the dividing line on an ultrasound between the superficial and the deep portions of that transverse left parotid gland. Anterior to the mandible, you'll see the masseter muscle. This is a landmark for locating the duct on an ultrasound. And the Stenson duct, which is the export duct for the parotid gland, is going to run anterior to the masseter muscle. In this diagram, you can see a common stone location for a stone that would be located within the Stenson duct. And it's important to distinguish if the stone is within this Stenson duct, like in the diagram, or if it's intraparenchymal, where the stone would be located within the parenchyma of the parotid. The stone is going to cause dilatation of the duct, making it easier to visualize, and you'll locate the Stenson duct as it runs anterior over the masseter muscle. In the middle diagram, you'll note a common stone location for a submandibular gland stone, and this is where most salivary gland stones form. It's important to determine if it's intraparenchymal versus in the Wharton's duct. The stone in the diagram is at the edge of the parenchyma of the salivary gland just as it's entering that Wharton's duct. In this diagram, the submandibular gland is hyperechoic, the mylohyloid muscle can be seen, and Wharton's duct is going to run below the mylohyloid muscle as it exits the submandibular gland. You'll also note the tongue below Wharton's duct. In the diagram to the far right, a stone is visualized near the sublingual gland. Note, however, that this is actually a submandibular gland duct, as Wharton's duct runs and Anterior over the top of the sublingual glands. On ultrasound, however, the stone can appear as if it's within the sublingual gland parenchyma. Note on this diagram the small ducts of Rivenus. This is where you would find a true sublingual gland stone, which is rare. On the diagram, you can note the connection between the ducts of Rivenus and the tongue, as well as the relationship between the sublingual gland gland and the Wharton's duct. And that Wharton's duct is going to run over the top of the sublingual glands and below the mylohyloid muscle. 
The next salivary gland pathology are masses within the salivary glands. Most salivary gland tumors are benign. Most commonly, they form in the parotid gland. And as a general rule, the smaller the salivary gland, the higher the risk of malignancy of a mass within that gland, with the highest risk of malignancy occurring in the sublingual and the minor salivary glands. While the majority of parotid tumors and about half of submandibular gland tumors being benign. The first type of mass that can form in a salivary gland is a cyst, and these primarily form due to trauma to the glands or blockage of the salivary duct. On ultrasounds, the cyst is going to appear anechoic with strong posterior enhancement, and it's going to appear avascular. Benign salivary gland masses can have any of the following features. They can be oval, lobulated, hypoechoic, have anechoic spaces. They're most commonly fairly well-defined. They can be hypervascular, have posterior enhancement and or calcifications within them. And the two most common benign solid masses in the salivary glands are pleomorphic adenomas and Warthin tumors. For malignant masses, there's multiple different types of malignant malignant masses that can be found in the salivary glands. And on ultrasound, they can have any of the following features. An irregular shape or border, blurred margins, hypoechoic, heterogeneous. They may also have mural nodules. These are nodules along the wall of a mass within an irregular cystic mass, and they tend to have internal vascularity. Other salivary gland pathologies include lymphoma, metastasis, and Sjogren's syndrome. Lymphoma is related to the lymphatic system, and this cancer can spread to the lymph nodes within the parotid glands. The ultrasound features would be round, enlarged, hypoechoic lymph nodes with absent hilums located in the parotid gland. You can also have metastasis, and this is when primary cancer from another site in the body metastasizes to the salivary glands. Most commonly, this would be a breast, a lung, or a renal cancer. The ultrasound features will be multiple hypoechoic, well-defined masses. Another salivary gland pathology is Sjogren's syndrome, and this is an autoimmune disorder where the immune system attacks the glands that produce saliva and tears, and this causes inflammation of the tear and salivary glands. And the ultrasound features are demonstrated in the image to the left. You'll see a heterogeneous gland, most commonly the parotid gland, with multiple anechoic to hypoechoic spaces within and a pattern of hypervascularity on color or power Doppler. If you enjoyed today's ultrasound topic and would like further videos on ultrasound, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe and tune in on Wednesdays when new content is released on Sonography Minutes.